Well, week two, Revival Concepts, the Spirit of Prayer. Homework reading is Acts 5 to 9. Anybody been doing the homework reading? We're going through the book of Acts. Yay. Awesome. We're talking about Revival Heart. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus. We welcome you, Lord Jesus, first and foremost, to this place. And uh, we thank you that you are the great general. And that even though we will be talking about different generals that you anointed here on earth in this unit, you are the general. And uh, we look to you tonight. We ask that you would speak to our hearts and change our lives. Like we often pray in revival, that you would revive our hearts, that you would speak forth your voice and address and direct your army tonight. Prepare our hearts for what you have in store. For uh, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind conceive what God has in store for those who love him. But you've revealed it by your spirit. So reveal by your spirit tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name. Everyone said? Amen. Amen. Well, I always love what God is saying in a fresh way, his new thing, his fresh word. And uh, he speaks through many ways, amen. I'm so excited that we're doing another School of Prophetic at the beginning of next year. So I want you to um, get ready for that. So even though some of you are finishing up with a bang with this unit, um, a two-year course, there's more. (laughs) Um, But in preparing for that, I can't help but talk about prophetic things. (laughs) It just kind of oozes, right? Um, What oozes out of you when you're squeezed, hopefully. Jesus. (laughs) Anyway, today I was um, sitting down in a cafe and the number of the table just happened to be 11. And uh, I was reading my emails and uh, Lenny had kindly sent through the itinerary for um, our trip to India where Pastor Blessing, hello Pastor Blessing if you can see us, hello, praise God, it's good to see you, looking forward to coming, looking forward to worshipping with you guys, Um, we received the itinerary, it's full on (laughs) and uh, they've got us going from meeting to meeting but I know that the grace of God will be upon us, Um, the last day is the biggest day of ministry, we've got three services to preach at morning, two services at night, another service, and then we get on a plane at two in the morning to come come back. So um, yeah, praise God, we're going to have to run with fire. <laughs> and guess what the date of that last culmination day is, is going to be? The 11th of the 11th. <laughs> so I think God's speaking. 11 is the number of the prophets, so let's turn to Matthew 11, 11, just to set the scene. Matthew 11, 11. Oh, you're already there. You are, you are so prophetic. Ah, <laughs> oh, there you go. I won't, uh, I won't steal your thunder too much. <laughs> But it's all the word, isn't it? Matthew 11, 11. Where are we? Can someone read that out? Amen. And before that, in verse 9, then what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you among those born of women, there has not risen anyone greater, everyone say greater, than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and violent people have been raiding it. I love the King James. The King James is better there, isn't it? Heaven suffers violence, the violent take by force. For all the prophets and the Lord prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah 
who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. I want to tell you that God is raising up a revival generation that will prepare the way. And it's clear here in Scripture that the greatest of all callings, the greatest of all is the one like John the Baptist who would prepare the way for Jesus to come. And I want to tell you that you are in the last leg of a relay race, that God is offering you a baton tonight, that these are the last days, that you were born in this season, in this time, born for such a time as this. And God's offer to you tonight is will you run? God's offer to you tonight is will you take up what is the greatest call, what is seen as the greatest in all of heaven, is this John the Baptist generation that runs in the spirit of Elijah, Malachi, end of Malachi, we're going to go there in coming weeks, in the spirit of Elijah, who will prepare the way for a move of God, prepare the way for Jesus. You are involved in a great work. I can tell you that the angels of heaven long to do what you do, to see what you see, to know what you know, to study into what we're going to study into tonight, that all of heaven is watching that prophecy has come forth about this city, that it will be the biggest, it will be the most prolific outpouring of the Holy Spirit ever on the face of the earth. And it will spread across the nation from nation to nation and will usher in the very return of the Lord Jesus himself. This is huge. This is heavy. And so we don't take these nights lightly. There is something of the preparation of the Holy Spirit going on in our hearts for something so important, something so vital. You are it. You are the revival generation. You are the last baton. If you don't take it up, who will? You know, my son... I have a bit of a testimony. He, we talk about uh, the Sunday service when we drive home from, from church and um, he often tells me, oh, you know, wow, I liked what you said there, Mum, or I like what Dad said there. Or... And uh, last week he told me that uh, he was over his friend's house and he began to prophesy over his friend about his calling. And he had these visions from God about his friend's calling and he told him and his friend said oh yeah maybe it'll happen maybe it won't and so he he came back and he said I was so grieved I I had to text him and he said when I know the he was texting him verses when I know the plans I have for you plans to prosper you not to harm you to give you hope in a future I can tell you that what we are breaking through in this time is not just for us it's for the next generation that they need to hit the ground running, that they need to know the true gospel, that they need to be preachers of the true gospel. And he said, Mom, I love him and care about him too much. I've got to tell him. <laughs> that same spirit has to fall on our children and on our spiritual children to come. Amen. That's love. We're breaking through. You are a breakthrough generation in the spirit of Elijah. And I do not take it lightly having visitation from him himself. And it's not that I'm anything special or worthy. I, I believe that God allowed a visitation of the, from the prophet Elijah because he has a destiny for us to prepare the way for Jesus to come. God selects specific ones to impart something, to encourage us. So be encouraged tonight. You are part of something that is heavenly, 
that is eternal, that is vital. You are the revival generation. Why don't you turn to someone and say, you are it. (laughs) Jesus in you, amen. Amen. (laughs) So the revival message, here we have in the notes, the revival message is nothing new. It is the same message Jesus preached, the words we read and read. It is the same message Paul preached. It is the same message Peter preached. It was the unadulterated gospel. Repent. Give your life. And uh, last week I shared about the vision of how God gave me a sword. And it wasn't a new sword. It was a well-worn sword. And God said to me, this gospel is nothing new. I preach this on the earth. And so did my apostles and my prophets. But I'm going to teach you how to use it. And you know what else? He was instructing me to start at the hip, remember? And to thrust. And he said, shoot from the hip, which means, in other words, tell it like it is. I want to tell you the hip. On Sunday, I talked about the the story of Jacob wrestling with God. What part of the body did God touch? The hip. See, Jacob was interceding. He's wrestling with God. It's a picture of the intercessor. The hip is the area that's unseen. Hopefully most of the time (laughs) unseen, right? But it is essential. It makes the framework. It takes the weight of the body. It's weighty. It's also part of the reproductive area of the body, the birthing. That's all about intercession. I want to tell you that the reason you can preach the gospel straight out, and last week I didn't hold back. (laughs) Nobody ducked for cover, (laughs) thankfully. You received it with gladness, praise God. But the reason you can use that gospel comes from a brokenness in intercession, a wrestling with God. The preaching of the true gospel must come from that. And so preachers of righteousness must come forth. The unadulterated gospel. Repent. It was a gospel that cut to the heart. Remember in the Acts. It was the high priest bringing people to a sacrifice. If we want to prepare the way for Jesus to come to our nation and pour out his spirit, we must be willing to bring a sacrifice. Elijah had to bring a sacrifice before the fire fell. Do we want the fire of God? Do we want the fire of God? Yes. Yes, we must bring a sacrifice. Revival heart concept. God's fire will not fall without a sacrifice. And here's the thing. To the extent we are willing to die to self, come on, the sacrifice is the extent to which you will have the fire of God in your life. That's his presence. I'm going to say that again. To the extent we are willing to die to self, is the extent to which you will have the fire of God. In revival, Steve Hill had an excellent message. You can look it up on YouTube called The Death of Mr. Me. (laughs) the death of Mr. Me it must come it must come there can be no fire without a sacrifice God's waiting for the sacrifice and you can't decide to sacrifice and then crawl off that altar (laughs) you've got to pick up your cross daily and follow him That's the message of the cross. That's the message of revival. So I ask you from that, who are you laying down your life for? Are you laying down your life for someone? Who are you laying down your life for? There's a whole nation whose destiny is in the balance. 
He's waiting for a people who are willing to pay a price, willing to be that sacrifice. John Wesley, and in your appendix, I've put down and uh, described from accounts the story and the account and the biography of John Wesley, a general in God's kingdom. But this is one of his quotes. I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. <laughs> There's a revival quote. Revival starts with me. Right? That's what it's all about. Now I encourage you this week to read his story. It has all the symptoms, all the characteristics of a true revival. He preached repentance. He was persecuted. He started off in university days. He would gather together with a few. It were just a handful. One of them was George Whitfield. You might have heard of him. Another revivalist. They happened to be at school together and they began to gather together to seek God. And every Wednesday and Friday they would fast till 3 p.m. Um, they would come together, read scripture, seek his face every morning. And uh, they had uh, this group, a revival group, that just wanted Jesus. And they began to be called, not by themselves, by others, the Holy Club. <laughs> They were seen as religious fanatics. You're too extreme. <laughs> You're too on fire. That's good. <laughs> and they would seek God with all their heart. And in that seeking, God began to download to John Wesley all the recipe and the heart and the fire of what was to be one of the greatest moves of revival in England in the early 18th century. And he preached holiness he preached repentance. He preached about the priests getting on their knees and seeking God. And fire fell. He addressed slavery of the time. He addressed, he brought revolutionary thinking. He put women in to preach. <laughs> that was revolutionary at the time. He wasn't afraid to break down barriers for what was right, for what was Jesus. And he was labeled a freak. He was labeled weird. He was labeled too much. And he didn't care. And in fact, one of his quotes you'll read in that story is, unless you are condemned by man, you're probably not born again. <laughs> he was willing to pay the price. So I encourage you. I encourage you to read his story. It will inspire you that this is not a new concept. That if there is a people willing to seek his face, to lay down their lives, and the first place you lay down your life is prayer. Now, prayer is the one thing that many churches neglect. <laughs> I've just heard of a major, major church on the south side that is known for its you know, Pentecostal signs, wonders, and miracles. It's a huge mega church, and they've just stopped having prayer meetings and altar calls. There's something wrong with that picture. My house shall be called House of Prayer. Now, that is a symptom straight out that Jesus is no longer at the helm, that man is. Why? Because prayer isn't popular. Nobody comes. Nobody will come. There's no big name speaker. There's no sensationalism. There's no lights, camera, action. What's happened to the church? That's grievous. I remember calling a prayer meeting, inter-church prayer meeting, and some didn't come because it was raining. Now, I understand if like a bridge goes out and you physically cannot get there, but most of these people were locals <laughs> and they thought it'd be called off because it was raining. Now, I can tell you, if you bought a footy ticket and it was raining cats and dogs, you would drive 
to the stadium, you would get up in the stands and you would cheer and you would be passionate and you would go, I don't care, my team's playing. You would worship. Who's your God? I can tell you, if God is God, you will go tooth and nail to get to seek his face. That will be your passion. I love in Korea how you have to play a bell to stop people from praying at church. They just come in praying. You can't stop them. And the pastor has to ring a bell to say, hey, the service is starting now. Stop praying. <laughs> That's revival. That's the house of prayer. So I want to tell you the true prophetic, coming back to the true prophetic. Revelation 3 says, if you're neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. What does a mouth represent? The prophet. The prophetic people. The mouthpiece. The true job of the prophetic, if it's doing its job, is to address complacency is to address lukewarmness, <laughs> is to address you're going after another God. That's why you don't get to the prayer meeting. If you love Jesus, if he is your one thing, <laughs> and yet you'll fight tooth and nail to get to a movie or get to something that's of pleasure or something that you really love and worship and bow down to. And so the prophet comes and say, Hey! Gonna, he's going to spit you out of his mouth. That's the true voice of God. Amen. The word tells us that we're called to be kings and priests. Revelation 1.6, right? Well, the high priest had access to the holy place and the holy of holies, which is a picture of true intimacy with Jesus and access to his presence that included the revelatory word, the lampstand, the golden lampstand. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. The golden lampstand was a revelatory word of God. His glory and authority, the bread of his presence, it was placed in two rows of six, twelve, all up. Apostolic authority. And six is authority, two rows of six. And a spirit of prayer, the altar of incense. These are all available, right? To us if first at the entrance though what do we find was the brazen altar the place where the priest called the people to come bring a sacrifice now we are called to be kings and priests right we are called to be like Jesus. He was a great high priest. What is one of the core jobs of a priest is to call people to bring a sacrifice, to lay down their lives. And I can tell you, if you have heard or been under a leader or a minister who does not do that, they are doing you a great disservice. They are keeping you in the outer court. There's intimacy with Jesus. There's revelation of the person, the word. There's the bread of his presence. There's altar of incense. That's why people don't want to pray. They haven't experienced that. They haven't come to this altar. I can tell you when I came to that altar, on the altar of revival and really gave my life and got all the sin out, the next day, the glory, the presence. I woke up to something I had never experienced in my whole life that was heavenly. And all of a sudden, the word of God leapt up from the page when I read it. It was like alive. And I said, this is your word, Jesus. This is the golden lampstand. Nobody took me to the altar before this. I had had 20 years of growing up in the church and nobody took me to the altar to give my life. That's revival. 
Revival is bringing people to the altar, preaching the true gospel. Give your life. Why? It's not because they're being mean. It's not because they're not kind. It's because they want you to have that. Jesus. And not just that. Then there's another level. Through the altar of incense was the holy of holies. Which I don't have time to talk about tonight. That is a whole unit in itself. And we have done that as a unit. But I encourage you there's more. So that's why we preach the true gospel. I want to tell you any preacher or minister of God who does not bring you to a sacrifice, does not preach the cross, is too afraid to preach the true fear of the Lord, is in danger of being false. You are presenting a different gospel. And it's clear in 2 Corinthians 11.4 that God hates that that you are a stumbling block. You are in the way. And we're going to talk about the spirit of religion in coming weeks. They are enemies of the cross of Christ. Philippians 3, 18 to 19. For there are many, everyone say many, many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears. This is the apostle speaking, Apostle Paul, who live as enemies of the cross of Christ in the Amplified, rejecting and opposing his way of salvation, whose fate is destruction, whose God is their belly, their worldly appetite, their sensuality, their vanity. You draw people in by food trucks and relationships and a good kids church and you'll find great friends and you do things man's way your God is your stomach whose fate is destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who focus their mind on earthly and temporal things if a minister does not preach the cross or the true scriptural fear of God bringing a sacrifice they are in danger of being false They are keeping you from true intimacy with Christ. This is serious. We're at the pointy end of the school. And that is why we are not holding back from you the truth. You must know this. Your cry as a minister, as a servant of Christ, must be, God, I cannot misrepresent you. God, I must present the full gospel. The whole lamb. So the sacrifice begins with revival prayer. Every move of God has started with a move of prayer and continues with a powerful move of prayer. Prayer is the engine room of the church. It's where the power comes from. It's unseen, but it gives it the grunt gives it the energy, the power. And I tell you, when revival hits, you're going to need power. There's going to be a running. There's going to be a sprinting. Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Acts 4.13, they noticed that they had been with Jesus. Now, prayer is putting God's interests first. Turn to Philippians 2.21. Now, I know that this is, this sounds pretty straightforward, but it would be, it is amazing how much we miss this concept. Philippians 2, 21, which says, For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he'd served with me in the work of the gospel. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. I 
want to tell you the first thing about prayer is what Jesus prayed. Not my will, but yours be done. And an organization that says it's the church and does not pray, does not put prayer front and center, is not looking after God's interests, but other interests have come in. Other idols have come in. Anything that takes the place of the presence of God is an idol. That includes performance, popularity, lights, camera, action, the phenomenon of ministry. <laughs> Anything that takes people off the presence of God, which is Jesus, to focus on something else. Evangelism, that's good. But without Jesus, <laughs> without seeking his face and knowing him, said here they had been with Jesus. That was the first thing they noticed. Anything that takes the place of his presence is an idol. And prayer is saying we are going after his presence. Prayer is the first port of call. It's putting God's interests first. It's saying, God, what do you want? It's saying, God, this is your church. I'm completely yours. It's putting his interests first. I can tell you for too long, man has put their interests first. What they want. I want the world by ministry. I want to have a nice lifestyle and put Jesus on the end of it. <laughs> Prayer is putting God's interests first. Revival heart concept, the very heart cry of revival prayer is, there's more. <laughs> it's a dissatisfaction with religion. It's a dissatisfaction of what we see. That Christ died for more than what we're seeing. That's the first heart cry of revival prayer. So where do we start? Quickly, let's look at the book of Matthew 5. So turn to Matthew 5 with me. I love how time and time again you'll find in scripture, we saw it in uh, Luke 14 last week, that the crowds would come to Jesus and then he would turn to them and he would give them the real gospel. <laughs> or in the book of John, he would turn to them and say, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, he wanted the real deal. He wanted the ones who were willing to receive the full gospel, the full message of Jesus. And he didn't care whether they left. If they had to leave, they had to leave. He wasn't preoccupied with numbers or popularity in any way. He wanted your heart. And the apostle said, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. He was looking for that heart. And so we see it here again in Matthew 5, verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. And he began to teach them about the real cost. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them. He said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we're going to look at this in the context of prayer. In the Amplified Classic, it says, blessed, happy, to be envied. Anyone want to be, someone looks, people look at it and go, oh, I want that. Because you've got Jesus. And spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction and God's favor and salvation, regardless of their outward conditions, love Amplified, are the poor in spirit, the humble who rate themselves insignificant, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want to tell you a revival heart concept. True revival prayer begins 
with the revelation of our utter need for Christ. You need to need him. Do we need him more than the next breath? Or have other things taken his place and numbed us to our true need of him? You know, many great revivals started in times of great need, in depression, in economic downturn. And I've heard many preachers say, oh, you know, we just need an economic downturn in this nation. I want to tell you, you don't need an economic downturn. You need something to happen in here. You don't need that outward. You need to need him desperately in here. It's a hard thing. That's the start of revival prayer. That there is no other hope for this nation. There's no other hope for this city. We have to have Jesus. You have to be in need of him. Turn to this account of the church of Laodicea. You'll know it well. Revelation 3. 14 to 22. This is the secret to revival. Verse 14. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds... You're outward, right? Probably going out in the streets. They're probably bringing in the lost. They're probably feeding the poor. They're doing all this good stuff. Great, but I know your deeds, but that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you. Some versions say vomit you. Out of my mouth, you say, in other words, you make me sick. This is Jesus speaking. You say I am rich. Watch this. I have acquired wealth and do not need, everyone say need, do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest, or it says in some versions, passionate and repent, zealous and repent. Here I am, this is to the church, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. To those who are victorious, I will give the right. This is, this is that. Holy place, holy of holies. I will give the right to sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I can tell you the Spirit of God is still saying this to the church. You don't need me. You've got your fancy lifestyle. You've got your friends. You've got your wealth. And yet you are blind. You're naked. You know, blind Bartimaeus knew he was blind. <laughs> That's why he could cry out, Son of David, have mercy on me. That was a cry of revival. He was someone in need. <laughs> Utter need. And that's what we must become. We must open our eyes to what Jesus sees, that we are spiritually poor. That we are blind. And only Jesus can open our eyes. Only Jesus can bring healing. Only Jesus can bring power. This is the first place of prayer. Our greatest need. When Jesus becomes the one thing. 
Psalm 27, 4, when he becomes the pearl of great price that you would give, sell, all to obtain. When the desperate cry comes forth that he is the only hope for the nation, that's when revival is at hand. What else do we find in Matthew? Blessed are those who mourn. And in the Amplified, I love this, who mourn over their sins and repent. For they will be comforted when the burden of sin is lifted. Matthew 5, 4. Repenting on behalf of a nation. If you want to grow in this area of godly sorrow that leads to repentance, I encourage you to read Ezra. Read Nehemiah. They knew how to throw themselves before God. Weeping. Repenting on behalf of a nation. They knew how to pray. It was revival prayer. Number three, knowing there's more. Matthew 5, 5, blessed, happy, blithe, and joyous, spiritually prosperous with life, joy, and satisfaction in God's favor and salvation regardless of their outward conditions are the meek, the mild, patient, long-suffering, for they shall inherit the earth. Did you know that we are called to inherit nations? We are called to inherit the earth. Psalm 2, ask of me. First of all, Jesus inherits the earth. But then we are inheritors. Ask of me and he will give you, I will give you the nations as your inheritance. There's more. We must open our eyes to see the promised land. Psalm 37, 29 to 31. Then the consistently righteous shall inherit the land and dwell upon it forever. The mouth of the uncompromisingly righteous utters wisdom and his tongue speaks with justice and truth amplified. The law of God is in his heart. These are all the qualities of someone who inherits. Number four, spiritual hunger. Matthew 5, 6. Blessed. And fortunate in that state in which the born-again child of God enjoys his favor and salvation, you will find his favor in this, are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, uprightness and right standing with God, for they shall be completely satisfied. Now, there is a false devil doctrine out there that says you are already there. You are, and they take some of the truth of God and pervert it. They say, you are the righteousness of God. Jesus did it all on the cross. But you don't have to seek him. You don't have to strive to know him. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to pray and go after him. You just have to rest in that. You are the righteousness. Just claim what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago. He already did all the work. Don't go after him. Don't. No, you don't have to want something more. But why would Scripture say, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness? Why? Because it says in the Word that you're saved, but then you're being saved. Because yes, he sees you as righteous, but then he's working out your salvation it says to hunger and thirst after righteousness. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. There is a seeking, there is a praying, there is an interceding, there is a going after God. I can tell you that doctrine is a doctrine of demons. To keep you from praying. To keep you from revival. To keep you lukewarm. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Spiritual hunger. Number five, ask God for mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall find mercy. Number six, zeal for purity of heart. These are all part of revival prayer. Blessed, anticipating God's presence, spiritually mature, are the pure in heart. Those with integrity, moral courage, love that. Moral courage and godly character, that they will see God. That's revival. 
they will see God, they will know him. Blessed are the pure in heart. They have moral courage. They are not afraid to speak what is right. They are not fearful of man. They have integrity and godly character. Blessed are the peacemakers. Now peacemakers also reconcile others to God. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. And I want to end with this. Number eight. Matthew 5, 11 to 13. Characteristic of revival prayer is those who are willing to be persecuted. Now we're going to read this whole section, verse 11 to 13, in the Amplified. Blessed, enviably, enviably sorry, fortunate and spiritually prosperous in the state in which the born-again child of God enjoys and finds satisfaction in God's favor and salvation, regardless of his outward conditions, are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for being and doing right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven now in this place and forever. Keep that in the back of your mind. Blessed, morally courageous. There's that concept again. And spiritually alive, that sounds like revival to me. Are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me or because of your association with me? Rejoice and be glad in the Amplified Classic, supremely joyful because great, strong and intense, absolutely inexhaustible, is your reward in heaven for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. And then it goes on to say, you are the salt of the earth. And it says, if you lose your saltiness, you are good for nothing except to be thrown on the ground and trampled underfoot. I want to tell you that most of what calls itself the church is being trampled underfoot. Why? Because they've lost this. They've lost the saltiness. What's the saltiness? It flowed right from that passage about being willing to stand up for what is right, to preach what is right, to preach the true gospel, and to be opposed, reviled, persecuted, falsely insulted, called names, Labeled, labeled a Jezebel, labeled an Old Testament preacher, had all of that. I don't care. I want Jesus. I don't care because great is my reward in heaven. Great is your reward in heaven. Rejoice. You're on the right track. This is part of the revival generation. We are preparing you for what is now and what is to come. It will only intensify. I can tell you when he pours out his spirit. You look at the opposition in the Acts church. They were willing to give their lives. They were willing to be called all sorts of things. To be imprisoned. To be tortured. To be beaten. This was the revival generation. And great was the reward in heaven. We're going to rejoice with them. Revival heart concept. The mark of a true prophet or prophetic generation. God's mouthpiece. Here it is. Is persecution. <laughs> and false accusation for preaching righteousness. If we want the kingdom of heaven to come, we must be willing to suffer persecution. And be rejected. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> I have been rejected. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I can tell you there are churches which, yes, there are people who call themselves a the church who will not come near me. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'll love you, but I'll tell you the truth. Because I want to know my Jesus. I want to preach him. I want to preach Christ and him crucified. That's the only way to that. 
you have to bring people to a sacrifice. That's love. That is the true high priest. I love Matthew eleven six. It says, Jesus said, and blessed, joyful, favored of God to be envied is whosoever, is he whosoever, who shall not be offended in me. Jesus said, or and is not hindered from seeing the truth. And I love the ERV version. Great blessings belong to those who don't have a problem accepting me. <laughs> I love that. That's what Jesus said. This is me. This is Jesus. Take it or leave it. The whole thing. The gospel. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the true gospel. We thank you for the message of revival. Father, we come to you in great need tonight. Utter need of Jesus. And Father, let us not move from that place until you come. And even more so when you come. We are in need of you. We are in requirement. Absolute desperate need of Jesus. So, Father, I pray for the spirit of prayer to fall on each one in this place. They will never be the same. Speak to our hearts. Change our lives tonight, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.